We're going to begin with hymn number 301. 301. Be ready with some of your favorites. We'll sing a few of those tonight. Hymn number 301. I know whom I have believed. Ready, say. I know. Against that, this 
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that one day that roll will be called and we'll be there together with you. And we praise you, Lord, for that wonderful hope that we have through your word that we can trust in it and believe in it and explain it and expo expose it to others that still do not know Christ as their personal Savior. We thank you, Lord, for your precious promises. And so we ask, Lord, that you will bless our service here tonight. We thank you so much for your power and your word. And Lord, we pray as Stephen speaks to us this evening that your Holy Spirit will move in our hearts, that we truly might understand your fullness and rejoice in your presence and give you the glory for all things. We ask, Lord, that you be with those that could not be with us this evening, wherever they might be. Bless them mightily, speak to their hearts, convict of sin and draw people to yourself. Lord, that we together as your people will glorify and praise your name. And then, Lord, we pray for those that are struggling, those that need a special touch from you. We especially ask that you'll be with Louise and this time undertake for her as well as Ray. You know his need. Lord, we pray that you'll draw near unto them, encourage them on their daily walk. And then, Lord, we ask that you'll be with uh, Greg, also with uh, Sophie. You know her need. Uh, speak to their hearts, Lord, that they might confidently put their confidence in you knowing that you're the one that is able to guide them and lead them in all things. We ask, Lord, that you'll bless our fellowship together this evening, be with the children also, that they might understand your fullness and your power. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it's good to have Stephen with us. It's been a long time. It seems like a long time since he's been here, and he's here with us tonight, and we're going to ask Stephen to come and share what God has upon his heart at this time. Well, good evening. Isn't it great to be together? I really miss being here in person. But let me tell you something. Even though we're not here in person, we watch you every Sunday evening and we watch you every Wednesday evening. So nothing goes amiss. I know exactly what you're doing. I know exactly what you're talking about and I know exactly what's being preached. And it's so wonderful. Uh, we're living down in Chile and being down in Chile, we can hook up out to the uh, cameras here, and we hear everything. And it's so wonderful. And of course, when we hear the gospel being preached, we hear Narayan speaking and Dennis speaking. We, we have a group of us sitting around my computer, and we're listening to the Bible studies, and we're listening to the Word of God. And it is just absolutely wonderful. You are ministering to people right there in Chile. What a joy that is. We had just, I've just got back from Chile. I arrived here last Tuesday morning at 5.40 in the morning. And I was in Ontario. That's what I flew into. And then Thursday, I flew out here. Friday, I went down to Ermskin. Didn't even know this place existed, but it does. And then from Ermskin, I came up here tonight. And I go back to Chile next Sunday to join my wife again. And uh, it's going to be great to see her. We've just had a tremendous time of ministry. And I want to say to you, as Community Bible Church, thank you for sponsoring the kids at the camp in Paraguay. We just had a tremendous, tremendous camp. And the whole theme was discover the call. Discover the call of God on your life. Discover who is Jesus in your life and the call he has on your life. I, sp I spoke on the first session on Monday morning. We had 480 kids, and I spoke on the first morning. And out of the people that you have sponsored, 27 came to the Lord. That was the first morning. That was the first morning. Then after that, we had sessions on Sunday, uh, Monday evening. We had sessions on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Friday, I spoke again, and we saw another 
92 come to the Lord. God is moving, and it's because of people like you who are helped sponsoring these kids that they are coming to the Lord. Now, you're probably saying, what about the follow-up? Well, we have churches that are following up these people, not just any church. We have a church that believes in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and Master of this universe, and these people are following up with these people. And it's absolutely superb to see what God is doing. And um, with, there was one little boy there, bless his heart, he was standing in line for food. And of course, anyone that comes through to get a, their food, you get a ticket. And then when you get to the table to get your plate, you put the ticket in a box. That way we know how many people have eaten that day. So he came up and I was standing right there and he says to the man giving out the tickets, uh, excuse me, he says, uh, what are the tickets for? And the man at the door said, well, the tickets are for free food. Free food? But then give me six tickets. I need six of them. And I said, why do you need six? He said, then I can take food home to my mother and to my father, and I can take food home to my brothers and my sisters. It was amazing. So now the Discover team are involved in this family and are taking care of them. It's absolutely super, all because, again, of community, Bible church, getting involved. You may say, well, we don't do much in this little church. You do a lot in this little church. You have ministry in the Philippines. You have ministry in Chile and in Paraguay. You have ministry in Pakistan. You have ministry around this world. Praise God for churches like this who are involved. This is what God wants us to be is involved in the kingdom of God. You know, I was thinking as I was driving up here today, and I was thinking, Jesus is better than anything else in this world. Jesus is better than anything else. This world that we are living in is literally falling apart. And you know, people don't realize it, people don't see it, but this church is literally falling apart right before our eyes. We're seeing an upside-down world. And in fact, I was thinking of John the Baptist. And even John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of the Messiah that was to come, the Christ that we know today, he was the forerunner. And he came and he told people about Jesus. And in fact, if you read in Isaiah, and we're looking at Isaiah 9 and verse 6, just turn to that passage of Scripture, Isaiah 9 and verse 6. Very familiar passage. We read it every Christmas. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Did you notice the titles that he's been given? These titles are very important. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. We have a responsibility as born-again believers to pray for the government that we have in power. We have a responsibility to pray for the Alberta government, for the federal government. We have the municipal government. We need to be praying for these people, that God would lead them in a way that they would lead the country. You see, one day when Jesus comes back, the government is going to be on his shoulders. And this world's going to be literally different than what we know it today. It's going to be a much better place. And I can't wait for that day. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called, number one, wonderful. How often do you go around and say, my savior is wonderful? I spoke to, to Esther uh, yesterday. And as we were talking, I said, what are you doing tonight, honey? She said, well, you know, the young people are getting ready to go and work with the homeless. So we're getting our cardboard boxes together, and we're going to be working on the streets with the homeless. And people are going to be living in these cardboard boxes. And I says, honey, his name shall be called Wonderful. Why? Because the mighty God, the wonderful Savior, are going to reach the homeless tonight. The wonderful Savior that we have who redeemed your life and my life is going to redeem the life of the homeless tonight. And she said, that is wonderful. And she said, I'm going to go and encourage the rest of the staff 
with those words. His name shall be called Wonderful. The next one it says is that he shall be called Counselor. Now I had the privilege of doing a lot of counseling in Paraguay just last week. And I had young people coming to speak to me. I had even some of the staff coming to speak to me. And they were talking about the abuses that they have been going through. And if I told you some of the abuses, you would be absolutely appalled by some of the things that are going on. But you know what's wonderful is to know that Jesus is our counselor. What's wonderful to know is that Jesus, we can come to him with all of our problems, with all of our difficulties, with all of our situations, and he will counsel us from the word of God. What a wonderful thing that is. We cannot live without the word of God. We need the word of God in every situation. And then it says that he shall be the mighty God. You know, we need a mighty God more than ever before today. We need a mighty God. And that mighty God is right here for you and me today. I'm absolutely appalled when I see what's going on around this world. And I just say, Lord, what's going on? Why is our world going crazy? Why is our world going the way that it's going? Why is it going this way? Do you know why? Because we do not have godly people in godly positions today. And we need to have godly people in positions in government. We need to have godly people around today. There are too many people around today that are literally, literally turning this world upside down. I just heard of a conference. And in this conference, it's really sad, but they have approved that homosexuals can get married within the church. And it's an evangelical church. I've just heard, uh, just also from this conference, and in fact it has literally split the denomination. Because they don't know what to do. And you know the denomination that's pushing for it more than anything else? He's here in Canada. Not even in the States. Not even in Latin America. Here in North America, here in Canada, they are literally saying, we will marry homosexuals. We're living in a sick world. We're living in an ungodly world. But praise God, he is a mighty, mighty God. And you know, this morning I was in church in Ermsgen and we sang, what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. And I thought, that's true, we serve a mighty God. And yet we walk around as though we've been defeated. We as Christians are not defeated. We are victorious. Because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We have an everlasting father. I spoke to a young girl Friday evening. After I shared my testimony. And I spoke to this young girl. And she said, but in your religion. And I turned around and I said, I do not have a religion. But she said, but you're a religious man. No, I'm not a religious man. I follow a savior. I follow Jesus Christ. Nowhere in the Bible, and folks, if you can show me, nowhere in the Bible does it say that I serve a religion. And this young girl came to me and she says, my parents don't go to church because of this religion. Well, I said, will you go back to your parents and say, this is not a religion. We are not traditionalists. We are literally having a reality and a wonderful relationship with Jesus Christ. And this girl said, well, explain it more to me. And I spent two and a half hours with this young girl, 19 years of age, living with her boyfriend, living in the parents' home, and I shared with her about Jesus Christ, not a religion. She said, well, I'm Catholic. I said, that's a religion. But what's the difference? But there's a lot of difference. One is man-made, and one is from the Word of God. One is what man, they're doing what man is telling them to do, and we are doing what God has told us to do. So she says, well, you know, the priest tells us that I have to go to confession. There we go. You've just said it yourself. The priest tells us. I said, a priest cannot forgive your sins. A priest cannot save your soul. There's only one mediator between God and man. And who is that? Jesus Christ. 
No one else. And this young lady turned around to me and she said, you seem to make sense. You seem to make sense. She doesn't go to church normally. She came on Friday. And so I challenged her to come this morning. And this morning she came and I was talking this morning about connecting people to Jesus. Connecting people to Jesus. And at the end of my sermon, I said, how many here would like to receive Jesus as your savior? How many here, I said, have been backslidden and you've been following tradition and not following Jesus? How many here? We saw 33 people, including this young lady, stand this morning to accept Jesus as her savior. You see, God is working. We serve a mighty God. We don't serve idols. We don't serve anyone but Jesus Christ. And then it says the everlasting Father. We have an everlasting Father. Isn't that great to know? We have a Father that's always there for us. Uh, But I want to say this. We need to respect the everlasting Father. We need to respect Him in a respectful way. I was in a church and I heard this. Hey, Daddy. Can you help me today? Hey, Daddy, can you? No, 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 no. We, we don't do things like that. We must have respect. Papa, can I ask you a favor? You know what? God doesn't give favors. I hate to tell you that. God's not a God of favors. God will either say yes or no. He will answer your prayers one way or the other. But he doesn't give favors. And I heard this and I was absolutely appalled by it. We have an everlasting Father And then we have a prince of peace. Isn't that wonderful to know that we have a prince of peace? He wants to bring peace to this world. That's why it says in Psalms, Shalom, Shalom, Yerushalayim, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Jesus will bring peace. And I was looking at at Luke chapter 7. I was looking at Isaiah 9, 6. And you know, if you look at Luke chapter 7 and verse 20, We we read about John and John's imprisonment and in fact being ready to be beheaded. Multiple scriptures prophesied about John that he would be the one that would open the door to the world and introduce Jesus as the Messiah. Folks, we are the ones who need to open the doors of people's hearts and introduce Jesus as the Messiah to the world that we are living in. It's time for us to go and proclaim it. In imprisonment, I can just imagine John speaking about the Savior. John had been telling the world that Christ was coming. John had been telling everybody. He had spent his life and his ministry telling people who would repent of their sins and that the one coming after him was greater than himself and he would take away the sins of the world. He was not afraid to talk about his Savior. He was not afraid to connect people together. He was not afraid to be the connector to Jesus. And it seems today as that Christians are ashamed or afraid to be the connector and introducing people to Jesus. At the end of John's life and behind the prison walls, there was a question. Was it worth it? Was it worth it? At all. Was it all for nothing? Do you know what? I'm going to stand here tonight and I'm going to say, it was worth it all to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. John had spent his life in service of God. And he was not afraid of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul was not afraid of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to be going out there Canada is a mission field. But not just a sending field anymore. In 1991, the Muslim Congress of London, England, had turned around and said, if we can win London with the, with the Islamic teachings, we can win the rest of the Western world. Folks, it's happening. Right before our eyes. Islam is spreading. But Jesus will have victory. We will see Jesus reign. Jesus will come back. And he will indeed reign forevermore. What a joy and a thrill to know that. 
We need to be proclaiming the good news. John was not afraid, even though he was in prison. The question John wanted the, to know the answer to is simply, is Jesus better than anything else? Is Jesus better than the life we have today? Is Jesus better than anything else? Is he better than John's baptism? Is he better than the prophets before him? Is he better than any God that was sent to change the world? And I'm going to say to you that Jesus is better than anything this world can offer us. Because this world is headed for destruction. We are literally destroying ourselves. There is no two ways about it. You see, so many people in the world are at a pinnacle in their lives where they are saying there has to be more to life than this. I hear it so often. In Toronto, we have a lot of affluential people, rich people. They go to church. They dress up nicely. But people are still asking the question, is Jesus better? Jesus is worth everything to me. Jesus should be worth everything to you. Lives need to be changed. People need to be delivered. Relationships need to be mended. Families need to be healed. We need to see a healing in our families. There are so many uh, families that are literally destroying themselves. Souls need to be saved. They are looking to find out what is real and what is not real. Shall I tell you a comment that someone in Chile said as they were watching the program here and as they were listening to what was going on, this is what they said. This church seems to know the answers to life problems and they always direct everything to the Bible. We cannot use anything else but the Bible. We cannot use anything else but the Word of God. One person turned around and says, I wish we could be there to hear more about what this church believes in and how they follow Jesus. We are a blessed church. Be why? Because everything is centered around the world. Whether it's historical, whether it's cross-referencing, we use the Word of God as our source. And that's what we need to use. You cannot use anything else. I spoke to a Mormon girl yesterday too who came to the breakfast. And this is what she said. She says to me, she says, but Joseph Smith is the only one that can lead us to heaven. How wrong can we be? And I says to her, do you know anything about the Book of Mormon? She said, I have one here. I said, open it up. And I said, now open it to the first page. It's called the introduction, just in case you forgot. And they opened it up. And I said, now go halfway down and read the paragraph that says, Joseph Smith said. So they went down. Oh, yes. What does it say there? Let me tell you first before you read it. Joseph Smith said that this book will, is the only book that will give you good direction. This book is better than any other book. And it's the only book that will lead you to everlasting life. And then they look, you're right. I said, but who said it? Joseph Smith said. Does it say Jesus? Does it say God? No, it says Joseph. So you are following a man-made religion. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. No other words were put there. He didn't say John said that. He didn't say Andrew said that. He doesn't say anything like that. He says Jesus said, I am the way. And folks, let me tell you, Jesus is the only way to heaven today. And people are looking for a way of where they can get to heaven, how they can get to heaven. And we have the answers. And I think, and I'm going to say this, that's why it's important that our witness be, the, be different than what the world expects. We need to have a witness 
that we'll have Jesus as number one in our lives. So that when people look at you, they see that you are not following the world, but that you are following Jesus and Jesus only. Very important. They need to see something different. Do they see something different in your life today? Do they see that you are following a savior and not a man? Jehovah's Witnesses follow Russell. Mormons are following Joseph Smith. Buddhists are following Buddha. Hindus are following 366 million gods. And yet we follow a savior. We follow someone who is alive and well today. And there's so many people today that are literally going down the wrong path. If our faith is helpless and hopeless, as the rest of the faiths of the world, then what do we have to offer? We have nothing to offer. But our faith is not going down this way. Our faith is in Jesus and Jesus alive. In Luke chapter 7, verse 20 and 21, it says, When the men were come unto him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come? Or we look for another. And in the same hour he cured many of their infirmities, plagues, and evil spirits. And unto many they were blind, he gave sight. It's interesting to me that when these men showed up and wanting to know if it was the real deal or not, he was busy healing and delivering and setting people free and from the stuff that was destroying their lives. Jesus is real. I wonder how many of us have many questions. And yet we're still trying to seek the answers. But let me tell you folks, the answers are here. They're here. We can't give any answers other than through the word of God. And our experience and the word of God need to go together so that we can share what it means to follow Jesus. Sometimes people are looking for the real deal and they go all over the world. When I was in Chile, I was flying off to uh, Paraguay. Lo and behold, I saw two people dressed in white. So I says to Esther, I said, they look like Sikhs. They look absolutely like Sikhs. I'm going to go and talk to them. And Esther, she just says, here we go again. Because you see, we're waiting to get on the plane, but I just can't keep still. I don't know about you. And here I saw these people, so I went over and spoke to them. I said, Sasrikaji. And they looked at me and they said, we don't speak Hindi. Oh. I said, are you Sikhs? Well, we are following the Sikh religion. I said, where did you learn about the Sikh religion? Oh, we're learning it online, on the computer. Do you know anything about these men? Do you know anything about these gurus? No, we know nothing. We're just picking it up as we go along. But we saw a picture and this is how we had to dress. So that we could be simple and not identify with the world. Oh, so I says to them, I teach on Sikhism. You do? Will you come to my home? At a visit to mi casa? I said, sure, I'll come and visit your home. I said, I will tell you about these gurus, these ten gurus, from Guru Nanak to Guru Gobind Singh, and I will tell you about the one who's over all of these called Guru Jesus. Who's Guru Jesus? I said, he's the savior of the world. These men can't save you. But Jesus can save you. And he just, they just looked at me. And then they got on the plane. I sat with Esther. We got off the plane. We went through, uh, through uh, passport control. I went to get my luggage. And they waited for me. And they said, this is my address. So I gave them my card. And they've been corresponding with me. And I've been telling them all about Jesus. And they said, how come no one has told us this before? Well, I says, because no one is so bold enough to tell you. But I'm bold enough to tell you that you're going to hell unless you accept Jesus. These gurus will not save you. But you see, we need to have that strength. We need to have that power. We need to stand up and share what Jesus means to us. 
And you see, I believe today that more than anything else, people are so imprisoned with themselves and with the things that they are looking for that Jesus is left out of the equation. They need Jesus. It was very interesting as I was speaking to these two young Spanish, Paraguayan Spanish people. And the young man came to me and he was almost barefoot, he just had flip-flops on, and he came to me and he says, he said, I really need to know about this Guru Jesus. Can he change my life? I said, well, none of the other gurus are going to change it. But Guru Jesus will. And then my friend Heino, who is a German Paraguayan, very complicated, and he was there meeting me, and I says to him, Heino, do you have any New Testaments in Spanish in your car? He said, yes, I have two. Good, I want them right now. So he went and he got them, came back, and I just saw them passing me. They were about ready to get into a taxi. I said, just a minute. And they said, why? I said, I have a book for you. It's just coming. Just wait. So they waited. I gave them the New Testament. And they're reading the New Testament. And they're getting to know Jesus. And they're talking about who is this Jesus. And they said, why that no one in Paraguay have told us about this before? But I'll tell you why. Because we're sleeping. And it's time to wake up. People are looking for answers in their lives. They need Jesus. They need the love of God. They need something that can put their lives back together. They need something that can heal them and deliver them. And that only is Jesus and no one else. I like the response Jesus said in Luke chapter 7 and verse 22. It says, then Jesus answering unto them, go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard, how the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor, to the poor and the gospel is preached. Folks, Jesus did something in those days. We need to be doing something in these days. If you see, Jesus' ministry was something that the world had never seen before. I tell you, people are looking for things in the wrong place. We're seeing people looking at, at all this different music that's going on today. And we're looking at all these different things. That is of the world. That is demonic. We need to have something that's wholesome and brings us right back to the cross. Do you know this is the only church I know for miles away that still uses a hymn book? And we need to have some of these older songs are songs with substance. And we need them. This morning in the church I was at, they had the old-fashioned songs, if that's what you want to call them. To me, they're not old-fashioned. These are wholesome songs. And one young boy came over to me and said, it's the same thing every week. We sing the same songs. I said, you know what? Maybe the Lord's trying to teach you something from the old same songs. And she said, well, what can he teach me? I said, learning to love him and to follow him and to trust him. Do you know there's a lot of people out there that are claiming to be the Christ. These are false teachers. And they're on our TV screens. And they're on our, in our churches. And they're leading people astray. Why? Because they're not in the word of God. They're all looking to religion. And they hope that religion will promise them something. And no one is doing anything about it. Jesus came along and what did he do? He did the miraculous. He came and did something that nobody else could do. He came and made a difference in a way that others only dreamed about. And let me tell you, we can be a difference to the world. We can lead someone to Christ. And that's what it's all about. Are we going to be world changers? Are we going to be the people who are going to make the way? Are we going to show people how important it is to follow after Jesus? Luke chapter 7 and verse 23 says, And blessed is he, whoever shall not be offended in me. You see, John the Baptist's ministry was a ministry of repentance. But Jesus told them in John 10.10, 10, the thief cometh, not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I come that they might have life 
<laughs> Did you hear that? Life. And that they might have it abundantly. But you see, so often we don't even have life ourselves. And yet Jesus has said, I come to give you life. And it's so important. Jesus told them that he was the only one to fulfill the prophecies. Jesus said, I am the one. But Paul said in Hebrews 11.25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. I'd rather suffer for Jesus. If it's going to bring someone to the Lord, I'd rather suffer. Because to me, I want to see people come. When I see some of these kids and how these kids have been treated and how these kids have gone about being hurt and how churches have literally destroyed people's lives. Jesus never destroys people's lives. He puts them together again. And so I want to challenge you tonight to, to think about, is Jesus better than anything this world can offer us? Is Jesus better than anything that we can do? Is Jesus better than this world that we're living in? And I'm going to say to you, Jesus is better than anything this world has for any of us. He's number one. And we need to put him as number one in our lives. Many of the people in Chile are saying, thank you for coming to share in the gospel. The kids are saying, thank you to you for letting us go to camp. These kids are saying thank you to you because through you we have found the light and the life that no one else can give us. A lot of these kids could still be in the streets. They could be in different areas. I don't have pictures tonight, but when we come back in the summer, you'll have pictures of what it means to some of these kids when they've come to know Jesus as their Savior. What a joy, what a joy feels good when we can go out and share with one person the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that you are the one that gives us life. You are the one that gives us. We thank you that even though the thief cometh but to steal and to destroy and to kill, you come that we might have life and have life more abundantly. And we thank you for that. Father, be with us tonight. Help us to follow you with all of our heart and with all of our soul. Father, I pray that you indeed help us to share that Jesus is better than anything this world can offer us. We give you praise tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. We have Chris come and lead us in a song as we close here to this evening. Turn to page 366. Page 366. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Ready? Say. What a fellowship, what a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a
Father, how wonderful it is to know that we have someone that we can lean on, that it is an anchor that is sure and steadfast, and that we can stand firmly in him. And so we pray, Lord, that you will speak to each one of our hearts. Help us to be a testimony and a blessing for you as we heard even this evening in this sermon. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will move in our hearts, that we might be found faithful in all things. We ask, Lord, that you'll bless each home and each person that is here today. Be with us as we uh, visit together and uh, have uh, fr refreshments at this time. Lord, we pray that all these, in all these areas we might glorify and praise your name. Be with the choirs, they practice also, that uh, together we might worship and praise your name as we sing and give praise unto you. Dismiss us now with your blessing, we ask in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen.